Chapter forty four of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Keevil. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter forty four The Vendetta. "'At what point shall I begin my story, Your Excellency?' asked Bertuccio. "'Where you please,' returned Monte Cristo, "'since I know nothing at all of it. "'I thought the Abbe Busoni had told Your Excellency. "'Some particulars, doubtless, but it is seven or eight years ago, "'and I have forgotten them. "'And I can speak without fear of tiring Your Excellency. "'Go on, Monsieur Bertuccio. "'You will supply the want of evening papers.' The story begins in 1815. Ah, said Monte Cristo, 1815 is not yesterday. No, monsieur, and yet I recollect all things as clearly as if they had happened but then. I had a brother, an elder brother, who was in the service of the emperor. He had become a lieutenant in a regiment composed entirely of Corsicans. This brother was my only friend. We became orphans. I at five, he at eighteen. He brought me up as if I had been his son, and in 1814 he married. When the emperor returned from the Isle of Elba, my brother instantly joined the army, was slightly wounded at Waterloo, and retired with the army beyond the Loire. But that is the history of the Hundred Days, Monsieur Bertuccio, said the Count. Unless I am mistaken, it has been already written. Excuse me, Excellency, but these details are necessary, and you promise to be patient. Go on, I will keep my word. One day we received a letter. I should tell you that we lived in the little village of Rogliano, at the extremity of Cape Corso. This letter was from my brother. He told us that the army was disbanded, and that he should return by Chateauroux, clermont ferrand Le Poy, and Nimes and if I had any money, he prayed me to leave it for him at Nimes, with an innkeeper with whom I had dealings. In the smuggling line, said Monte Cristo, Eh, Your Excellency, every one must live. Certainly, go on. I loved my brother tenderly, as I told Your Excellency, and I resolved not to send the money, but to take it to him myself. I possessed a thousand francs. I left five hundred with Assunta, my sister-in-law, and with the other five hundred set off for Nimes. It was easy to do so, and as I had my boat and a lading to take in at sea, everything favoured my project. But after we had taken our cargo, the wind became contrary, so that we were four or five days without being able to enter the Rhone. At last, however, we succeeded, and worked up to Arles. I left the boat between Bellegarde and Bouquer, and took the road to Nimes. We are getting to the story now. Yes, Your Excellency, excuse me, but as you will see, I only tell you what is absolutely necessary. Just at this time, the famous massacres took place in the south of France. Three brigands called Trestalion, Truffemi, and Graffin publicly assassinated everybody whom they suspected of Bonapartism. You have doubtless heard of these massacres, Your Excellency. Vaguely, I was far from France at that period. Go on. As I entered Nimes, I literally waded in blood. At every step you encountered dead bodies and bands of murderers who killed, plundered and burned. At the sight of this slaughter and devastation, I became terrified, not for myself, for I, as a simple Corsican fisherman, had nothing to fear. On the contrary, that time was most favourable for us smugglers, but for my brother, a soldier of the Empire, returning from the army of the Loire with his uniform and his epaulettes, there was everything to apprehend. I hastened to the innkeeper. My misgivings had been but too true. My brother had arrived the previous evening at Nimes, and at the very door of the house where he was about to demand hospitality, he had been assassinated. I did all in my power to discover the murderers, but no one durst tell me their names. So much were they dreaded, 
I then thought of that French justice of which I had heard so much, and which feared nothing, and I went to the king's attorney. And this king's attorney was named Villefort, asked Monte Cristo carelessly. Yes, Your Excellency, he came from Marseilles, where he had been deputy procureur. His seal had procured him advancement, and he was said to be one of the first who had informed the government of the departure from the island of Elba. Then, said Monte Cristo, you went to him. Monsieur, I said my brother was assassinated yesterday in the streets of Nimes. I know not by whom, but it is your duty to find out. You are the representative of justice here, and it is for justice to avenge those she has been unable to protect. Who was your brother, asked he, a lieutenant in the Corsican battalion, a soldier of the usurper then, a soldier of the French army. Well, replied he, he is smitten with the sword, and he has perished by the sword. You are mistaken, monsieur, I replied. He has perished by the poniard. What do you want me to do? asked the magistrate. I have already told you. Avenge him. On whom? On his murderers. How should I know who they are? Order them to be sought for. Why, your brother has just been involved in a quarrel and killed at a duel. All these old soldiers commit excesses which were tolerated in the time of the emperor, but which are not suffered now, for the people here do not like soldiers of such disorderly conduct. Monsieur, I replied, it is not for myself that I entreat your interference. I should grieve for him or avenge him, but my poor brother had a wife, and were anything to happen to me, the poor creature would perish from want, for my brother's pay alone kept her. Pray, try and obtain a small government pension for her. Every revolution has its catastrophes, returned Monsieur de Villefort. Your brother has been the victim of this. It is a misfortune, and government owes nothing to his family. If we are to judge by all the vengeance that the followers of the usurper exercised on the partisans of the king, when, in their turn, they were in power, your brother would be today, in all probability, condemned to death. What has happened is quite natural, and in conformity with the law of reprisals. What? I cried. Do you, a magistrate, speak thus to me? All these Corsicans are mad on my honour, replied Monsieur de Filivore. They fancy that their countryman is still emperor. You have mistaken the time. You should have told me this two months ago. It's too late now. Go now at once, or I shall have you put out. I looked at him in an instant to see if there was anything to hope from further entreaty. But he was a man of stone. I approached him and said in a low voice, Well, since you know the Corsicans so well, you know that they always keep the word. You think that it was a good deed to kill my brother, who was a Bonapartist, because you are a royalist. Well, I, who am a Bonapartist also, declare one thing to you, which is, that I will kill you. From this moment I declare the vendetta against you. So protect yourself as well as you can, for the next time we meet, your last hour has come. And before he had recovered from his surprise, I opened the door and left the room. Well, well, said Monte Cristo, such an innocent-looking person as you are to do these things, Monsieur Petruccio, and to a king's attorney at that. But did he know what was meant by the terrible word vendetta? He knew so well that from that moment he shut himself in his house and never went out unattended, seeking me high and low. Fortunately, I was so well concealed that he could not find me. Then he became alarmed and dared not stay any longer at Nimes. So he solicited a change of residence, and as he was in reality very influential, he was nominated to Versailles. But as you know, a Corsican who has sworn to avenge himself cares not for distance. So his carriage, fast as it went, was never above half a day's journey before me, who followed him on foot. The most important thing was not to kill him only, for I had an opportunity of doing so a hundred times, but to kill him without being discovered, at least without being arrested. I no longer belonged to myself, for I had my sister-in-law to protect and provide for. 
For three months I watched Monsieur de Villefort. For three months he took not a step out of doors without my following him. At length I discovered that he went mysteriously to Auteuil. I followed him thither and saw him enter the house where we now are, only instead of entering by the great door that looks into the street, he came on horseback or in his carriage, left the one or the other at the little inn, and entered by the gate you see there. Monte Cristo made a sign with his head to show that he could discern in the darkness the door to which Bertuccio alluded. As I had nothing more to do at Versailles, I went to Auteuil and gained all the information I could. If I wished to surprise him, it was evident that this was the spot to lie in wait for him. The house belonged, as the concierge informed your excellency, to Monsieur de saint Marin, Villefort's father-in-law. Monsieur de saint Marin lived in Marseilles, so that this country house was useless to him, and it was reported to be let to a young widow known only by the name of the Baroness. One evening, as I was looking over the wall, I saw a young and handsome woman who was walking alone in that garden, which was not overlooked by any windows, and I guessed that she was awaiting Monsieur de Villefort. When she was sufficiently near for me to distinguish her features, I saw that she was from eighteen to nineteen, tall and very fair. As she had a loose muslin dress on, and as nothing concealed her figure, I saw that she would ere long become a mother. A few moments after the little door was opened, and a man entered. The young woman hastened to meet him. They threw themselves into each other's arms, embraced tenderly, and returned together to the house. The man was Monsieur de Villefort. I fully believe that when he went out in the night he would be forced to traverse the whole of the garden alone. And asked the Count, did you ever know the name of this woman? No, Excellency, returned Bertuccio. You will see that I had no time to learn it. Go on. That evening, continued Bertuccio, I could have killed the procureur, but as I was not sufficiently acquainted with the neighbourhood, I was fearful of not killing him on the spot, and that if his cries were overheard, I might be taken. So I put it off until the next occasion, and in order that nothing should escape me, I took a chamber looking into the street bordered by the wall of the garden. Three days after, about seven o'clock in the evening, I saw a servant on horseback leave the house at full gallop and take the road to Sevres. I concluded he was going to Versailles, and I was not deceived. Three hours later the man returned, covered with dust. His errand was performed, and two minutes after another man on foot, muffled in a mantle, opened the little door of the garden, which he closed after him. I descended rapidly. Although I had not seen Villefort's face, I recognised him by the beating of my heart. I crossed the street and stopped at a post placed at the angle of the wall, and by means of which I had once before looked into the garden. This time I did not content myself with looking, but I took my knife out of my pocket, felt that the point was sharp, and sprang over the wall. My first care was to run to the door. He had left the key in it, taking the simple precaution of turning it twice in the lock. Nothing then preventing my escape by this means. I examined the grounds. The garden was long and narrow. A stretch of smooth turf extended down the middle, and at the corners were clumps of trees with thick and massy foliage that made a background for the shrubs and flowers. In order to go from the door to the house, or from the house to the door, Monsieur de Villefort would be obliged to pass by one of these clumps of trees. It was the end of September. The wind blew violently. The faint glimpses of the pale moon, hidden momentarily by masses of dark clouds that were sweeping across the sky, whitened the gravel walks that led to the house, but were unable to pierce the obscurity of the thick shrubberies in which a man could conceal himself without any fear of discovery. I hid myself in the one nearest to the path Villefort must take, and scarcely was I there when amidst the gusts of wind I fancied I heard groans. 
but you know or rather you do not know your excellency that he is about to commit an assassination fancies that he hears low cries perpetually ringing in his ears two hours passed thus during which i imagined i heard moans repeatedly midnight struck as the last stroke died away i saw a faint light shine through the windows of the private staircase by which we have just descended the door opened and the man in the mantle reappeared the terrible moment had come but i had so long been prepared for it that my heart did not fail in the least i drew my knife from my pocket again opened it and made ready to strike the man in the mantle advanced towards me but as he drew near i saw that he had a weapon in his hand i was afraid not of a struggle but of a failure when he was only a few paces from me i saw that what i had taken for a weapon was only a spade i was still unable to divine for what reason monsieur de villefort had this spade in his hands when he stopped close to the thicket where i was glanced around and began to dig a hole in the earth i then perceived that he was hiding something under his mantle which he laid on the grass in order to dig more freely then i confess curiosity mingled with hatred i wished to see what villefort was going to do there and i remained motionless holding my breath then an idea crossed my mind which was confirmed when i saw the procureur lift from under his mantle a box two feet long and six or eight inches deep i let him place the box in the hole he had made then while he stamped with his feet to remove all traces of his occupation i rushed on him and plunged my knife into his breast exclaiming i am giovanni bertuccio thy death for my brothers thy treasure for his widow thou seest that my vengeance is more complete than i had hoped i know not if he heard these words i think he did not for he fell without a cry i felt his blood gush over my face but i was intoxicated i was delirious and the blood refreshed instead of burning me in a second i had disinterred the box then that it might not be known i had done so i filled up the hole threw the spade over the wall and rushed through the door which i doubled locked carrying off the key ah said monte cristo it seems to me this was nothing but murder and robbery no your excellency returned bertuccio it was a vendetta followed by restitution and was the sum a large one it was not money ah i recollect replied the count did you not say something of an infant yes excellency i hastened to the river sat down on the bank and with my knife forced open the lock of the box in a fine linen cloth was wrapped a newborn child its purple visage and its violet-coloured hands showed that it had perished from suffocation but as it was not yet cold i hesitated to throw it into the water that ran at my feet after a moment i fancied that i felt a slight pulsation of the heart and as i had been assistant at the hospital at bastia i did what a doctor would have done i inflated the lungs by blowing air into them and at the expiration of a quarter of an hour it began to breathe and cried feebly in my turn i uttered a cry but a cry of joy god has not cursed me then i cried since he permits me to save the life of a human creature in exchange for the life i have taken away and what did you do with the child asked monte cristo it was an embarrassing load for a man seeking to escape i had not for a moment the idea of keeping it but i knew that at paris there was an asylum where they received such creatures as i passed the city gates i declared that i had found the child on the road and i inquired where the asylum was the box confirmed my statement the linen proved that the infant belonged to wealthy parents the blood with which i was covered might have proceeded from the child as well as from any one else no objection was raised but they pointed out the asylum 
which was situated at the upper end of the Rue de Enfer, and after having taken the precaution of cutting the linen in two pieces, so that one of the two letters which marked it was on the piece wrapped around the child, while the other remained in my possession, I rang the bell and fled with all speed. A fortnight after, I was at Rogeliano, and said to Assunta, Console thyself, sister. Israel is dead, but he is avenged. She demanded what I meant, and when I had told her all, Giovanni, said she, you should have brought this child with you. We would have replaced the parents it has lost. Have called it Benedetto, and then, in consequence of this good action, God would have blessed us. In reply, I gave her the half of the linen I had kept in order to reclaim him if we became rich. What letters were marked on the linen, said Monte Cristo? An H and an N, surmounted by a baron's coronet. By heaven, Monsieur Bertuccio, you make use of heraldic terms. Where did you study heraldry? In your service, Excellency, where everything is learned. Go on, I am curious to know two things. What are they, Your Excellency? What became of this little boy, for I think you told me it was a boy, Monsieur Bertuccio? No, Excellency, I do not recollect telling you that. I thought you did. I must have been mistaken. No, you were not, for it was in reality a little boy. But Your Excellency wished to know two things. What was the second? The second was the crime of which you were accused when you asked for a confessor, and the Abbe Bersoni came to visit you at your request in prison at Nimes. The story will be very long, Excellency. What matter? You know I take but little sleep, and I do not suppose you are very much inclined for it either. Bertuccio bowed and resumed his story. Partly to drown the recollections of the past that haunted me, partly to supply the wants of the poor widow, I eagerly returned to my trade of smuggler, which had become more easy since that relaxation of the laws which always follows a revolution. The southern districts were ill-watched in particular, in consequence of the disturbances that were perpetually breaking out in Avignon, Nimes or Uzes. We profited by this respite on the part of the government to make friends everywhere. Since my brother's assassination in the streets of Nimes, I had never entered the town. The result was that the innkeeper, with whom we were connected, seeing that we would no longer come to him, was forced to come to us, and had established a branch to his inn on the road from Bellicard to Bouquer, at the sign of the Pont de Garde. We had thus at Ajus Mortes, Martijus or Buch, a couple of places where we left our goods, and where, in case of necessity, we concealed ourselves from the gendarmes and custom-house officers. Smuggling is a profitable trade when a certain degree of vigour and intelligence is employed. As for myself, brought up in the mountains, I had a double motive for fearing the gendarmes and custom-house officers as my appearance before the judges would cause an inquiry, and an inquiry always looks back into the past, and in my past life they might find something far more grave than the selling of smuggled cigars or barrels of brandy without a permit. So preferring death to capture, I accomplished the most astonishing deeds, and which more than once showed me that the too great a care we take of our bodies is the only obstacle to success of those projects which require rapid decision and vigorous and determined execution. In reality, when you have once devoted your life to your enterprises, you are no longer the equal of other men, or rather other men are no longer your equals, and whosoever has taken this resolution feels his strength and resources doubled. Philosophy, Monsieur Bertuccio, interrupted the Count, you have done a little of everything in your life. Oh, Excellency! No, no, but philosophy at half-past ten at night is somewhat late, yet I have no other observation to make for what you say is correct, which is more than could be said for all of philosophy. 
My journeys became more and more extensive and more productive. A sunter took care of all, and our little fortune increased. One day, as I was setting off on an expedition, Go, said she, at your return I will give you a surprise. I questioned her, but in vain. She would tell me nothing, and I departed. Our expedition lasted nearly six weeks. We had been to Lucca to take in oil, to Leghorn for English cottons, and we ran our cargo without opposition, and returned home full of joy. When I entered the house, the first thing I beheld in the middle of a Sunter's chamber was a cradle that might be called sumptuous compared with the rest of the furniture, and in it a baby seven or eight months old. I uttered a cry of joy. The only moments of sadness I had known since the assassination of the procureur were caused by the recollection that I had abandoned this child. For the assassination itself I had never felt any remorse. Poor Assunta had guessed all. She had profited by my absence, and furnished with the half of the linen, and having written down the day and hour at which I had deposited the child at the asylum, had set off for Paris, and had reclaimed it. No objection was raised, and the infant was given up to her. Ah, I confess, Your Excellency, when I saw this poor creature sleeping peacefully in its cradle, I felt my eyes filled with tears. Ah, Sunter, cried I, you are an excellent woman, and heaven will bless you. This, said Monte Cristo, is less correct than your philosophy. It is only faith. Alas, your excellency is right, replied Bertuccio, and God made this infant the instrument of our punishment. Never did a perverse nature declare itself more prematurely, and yet it was not owing to any fault in his bringing up. He was a most lovely child, with large blue eyes of that deep colour that harmonises so well with the blonde complexion. Only his hair, which was too light, gave his face a most singular expression, and added to the vivacity of his look, and the malice of his smile. Unfortunately there is a proverb which says that red is either altogether good or altogether bad. The proverb was but too correct as regarded Benedetto, and even in his infancy he manifested the worst disposition. It is true that the indulgence of his foster-mother encouraged him. The child, for whom my poor sister would go to the town, five or six leagues off, to purchase the earliest fruits and the most tempting sweetmeats, preferred to Parma grapes or Genoese preserves, the chestnuts stolen from a neighbour's orchard, or the dried apples in his loft, when he could eat as well off the nuts and apples that grew in my garden. One day, when Benedetto was about five or six, our neighbour, Vasilio, who, according to the custom of the country, never locked up his purse or his valuables, for as your excellency knows, there are no thieves in Corsica, complained that he had lost a louis out of his purse. We thought he must have made a mistake in counting his money, but he persisted in the accuracy of his statement. One day Benedetto, who had been gone from the house since morning, to our great anxiety, did not return until late in the evening dragging a monkey after him, which he said he had found chained to the foot of a tree. For more than a month past, the mischievous child, who knew not what to wish for, had taken into his head to have a monkey. A boatman, who had passed by Rogeliano, and who had several of these animals, whose tricks had greatly diverted him, had doubtless suggested this idea to him. "'Monkeys are not found in our woods, chained to trees,' said I. Confess how you obtained this animal. Benedetto maintained the truth of what he had said, and accompanied it with details that did more honour to his imagination than to his veracity. I became angry. He began to laugh. I threatened to strike him, and he made two steps backwards. You cannot beat me, said he. You have no right, for you are not my father. We never knew who had revealed this fatal secret which we had so carefully concealed from him. However, it was this answer, in which the child's whole character revealed itself, that almost terrified me, and my arm fell without touching him. 
the boy triumphed, and this victory rendered him so audacious that all the money of Asunta, whose affection for him seemed to increase as he became more unworthy of it, was spent in caprices she knew not how to contend against, and follies she had not the courage to prevent. When I was at Rogeliano everything went on properly, but no sooner was my back turned than Benedetto became master, and everything went ill. When he was only eleven, he chose his companions from among the young men of eighteen or twenty, the worst characters in Bastia, or indeed in Corsica, and they had already for some mischievous pranks been several times threatened with prosecution. I became alarmed, as any prosecution might be attended with serious consequences. I was compelled at this period to leave Corsica on an important expedition. I reflected for a long time, and with the hope of averting some impending misfortune, I resolved that Benedetto should accompany me. I hoped that the active and laborious life of a smuggler, with a severe discipline on board, would have a salutary effect on his character, which was now well nigh, if not quite, corrupt. I spoke to Benedetto alone, and proposed to him to accompany me, endeavouring to tempt him by all the promises most likely to dazzle the imagination of a child of twelve. He heard me patiently, and when I had finished, burst out laughing. Are you mad, uncle? He called me by this name when he was in good humour. Do you think I am going to change the life I lead for your mode of existence? My agreeable indolence for the hard and precarious toil you impose on yourself? exposed to the bitter frost at night and the scorching heat by day, compelled to conceal yourself, and when you are perceived, receive a volley of bullets, all to earn a paltry sum. Why, I have as much money as I want. Mother Asanta always furnishes me when I ask for it. You see that I should be a fool to accept your offer. The arguments and his audacity perfectly stupefied me. Benedetto rejoined his associates, and I saw him from a distance point me out to them as a fool. Sweet child, murmured Monte Cristo. Oh, had he been my own son, replied Bertuccio, even my nephew, I would have brought him back to the right road, for the knowledge that you are doing your duty gives you strength. But the idea that I was striking a child whose father I had killed made it impossible for me to punish him. I gave my sister, who constantly defended the unfortunate boy, good advice, and as she confessed that she had several times missed money to a considerable amount, I showed her a safe place in which to conceal our little treasure for the future. My mind was already made up. Benedetto could read, write, and cipher perfectly, for when the fit seized him he learned more in a day than others in a week. My intention was to enter him as a clerk in some ship, and without letting him know anything of my plan, to convey him some morning on board. By this means his future treatment would depend upon his own conduct. I set off for France after having fixed upon the plan. Our cargo was to be landed in the Gulf of Lyon, and this was a difficult thing to do, because it was then the year 1829. The almost perfect tranquillity was restored, and the vigilance of the custom-house officers was redoubled, and their strictness was increased at this time in consequence of the fair at Bouquet. Our expedition made a favourable beginning. We anchored our vessel, which had a double hold where our goods were concealed, amidst a number of other vessels that bordered the banks of the Rhone from Bouclair to Arles. On our arrival we began to discharge our cargo in the night, and to convey it into the town, by the help of the innkeeper with whom we were connected. Whether success rendered us imprudent, or whether we were betrayed, I know not. But one evening, about five o'clock, our little cabin boy came breathlessly to inform us that he had seen a detachment of customs house officers advancing in our direction. It was not their proximity that alarmed us, for detachments were constantly patrolling along the banks of the Rhone, but the care, according to the boy's account, that they took to avoid being seen. In an instant we were on the alert, but it was too late. Our vessel was surrounded, 
and amongst the customs house officers i observed several gendarmes and as terrified at the sight of their uniforms as i was brave at the sight of any other i sprang into the hold opened a port and dropped into the river dived and only rose to intervals to breathe until i reached a ditch that had recently been made from the rhone to the canal that runs from beaucaire to asia's mortis i was now safe for i could swim along the ditch without being seen and i reached the canal in safety i had designedly taken this direction i have already told your excellency of the innkeeper from nimes who had set up a little tavern on the road from bellegarde to beaucaire yes said monte cristo i perfectly recollect him i think he was your colleague precisely answered bertuccio but he had seven or eight years before this period sold his establishment to a tailor at marseilles who having almost ruined himself in his old trade wished to make his fortune in another of course we made the same arrangements with the new landlord that we had with the old and it was of this man that i intended to ask shelter what was his name inquired the count who seemed to become somewhat interested in bertuccio's story gaspard caderousse he had married a woman from the village of carconte and whom we did not know by any other name than that of her village she was suffering from malarial fever and seemed dying by inches as for her husband he was a strapping fellow of forty or five and forty who had more than once in a time of danger given ample proof of his presence of mind and courage and you say interrupted monte cristo that this took place towards the year eighteen twenty nine your excellency in what month june the beginning or the end the evening of the third ah said monte cristo the evening of the third of june eighteen twenty nine go on it was from caderousse that i intended demanding shelter and as we never entered by the door that opened on to the road i resolved not to break through the rule so climbing over the garden hedge i crept amongst the olive and wild fig trees and fearing that caderousse might have some guest i entered a kind of shed in which i had often passed the night and which was only separated from the inn by a partition in which holes had been made in order to enable us to watch an opportunity of announcing our presence my intention was if caderousse was alone to acquaint him with my presence finish the meal the custom-house officers had interrupted and profit by the threatened storm to return to the rhone and ascertain the state of our vessel and its crew i stepped into the shed and it was fortunate i did so for at that moment caderousse entered with a stranger i waited patiently not to overhear what they said but because i could do nothing else besides the same thing had occurred often before the man who was with caderousse was evidently a stranger to the south of france he was one of those merchants who come to sell jewellery at the beaucaire fair and who during the month the fair lasts and during which there is so great an influx of merchants and customers from all parts of europe often have dealings to the amount of a hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand francs caderousse entered hastily then seeing that the room was as usual empty and only guarded by the dog he called to his wife hallo carconte said he the worthy priest has not deceived us the diamond is real an exclamation of joy was heard and the staircase creaked beneath a feeble step what do you say asked his wife pale as death i say that the diamond is real and that this gentleman one of the first jewellers of paris will give us fifty thousand francs for it only in order to satisfy himself that it really belongs to us he wishes you to relate to him as i have done already the miraculous manner in which the diamond came into our possession in the meantime please sit down monsieur and i will fetch you some refreshment the jeweller examined attentively the interior of the inn and the apparent poverty of the persons who were about to sell him a diamond that seemed to have come from the casket of a prince relate your story madame said he wishing no doubt to profit by the absence of the husband so that the latter could not influence the wife's story 
to see if the two recitals tallied. Oh, returned she, it was a gift of heaven. My husband was a great friend in 1814 or 1815 of a sailor named Edmund Dantes. This poor fellow, whom Carderousse had forgotten, had not forgotten him, and at his death he bequeathed this diamond to him. But how did he obtain it? asked the jeweller. Had he it before he was imprisoned? No, monsieur, but it appears that in prison he made the acquaintance of an Englishman, and as in prison he fell sick, and Dantes took the same care of him as if he had been his brother. The Englishman, when he was set free, gave this stone to Dantes, who, less fortunate, died, and in his turn left it to us, and charged the excellent abbe, who was here this morning, to deliver it. The same story, muttered the jeweller, and improbable as it seemed at first, it may be true. There is only the price we are not agreed about. How not agreed about, said Carderousse. I thought we agreed for the price I asked. That is, replied the jeweller, I offered forty thousand francs. Forty thousand, cried La Carconte. We will not part with it for that sum. The abbe told us it was worth fifty thousand without the setting. What was the abbe's name? asked the indefatigable questioner. The abbe Busoni, said La Carconte. He was a foreigner, an Italian from the neighbourhood of Mantua, I believe. Let me see this diamond again, replied the jeweller. The first time you are often mistaken as to the value of a stone. Carderousse took from his pocket a small case of black chagrin, opened and gave it to the jeweller. At the sight of the diamond, which was as large as a hazelnut, La Carconte's eyes sparkled with cupidity. And what did you think of this fine story, eavesdropper, said Monte Cristo? Did you credit it? Yes, Your Excellency, I did not look on Caderousse as a bad man, and I thought him incapable of committing a crime or even a theft. That did you more honour to your heart than to your experience, Monsieur Bertuccio. Had you known this Edmond Dantes of who they spoke? No, Your Excellency, I had never heard of him before and never but once afterwards, and that was from the Abbe Busoni himself when I saw him in prison at Nimes. Go on. The jeweller took the ring, and drawing from his pocket a pair of steel pliers and a small set of copper scales, he took the stone out of its setting and weighed it carefully. I will give you forty-five thousand, said he, but not a sou more. Besides, that is the exact value of the stone. I brought just that sum with me. Oh, that's no matter, replied Carderousse. I will go back with you to fetch the other five thousand francs. No, it's worth no more, and I am sorry I offered so much, for the stone has a flaw in it, which I had not seen. However, I will not go back on my word, and I will give forty-five thousand. At least replace the diamond in the ring, said La Carconte sharply. Ah, true, replied the jeweller, and he reset the stone. No matter, observed Caderousse, replacing the box in his pocket. Someone else will purchase it. Yes, continued the jeweller, but someone else will not be so easy as I am, or content himself with the same story. It is not natural that a man like you should possess such a diamond. He will inform against you. You will have to find the Abbey Busoni, and abbeys who give diamonds worth two thousand louis are rare. The law would seize it and put you in prison. If at the end of three or four months you are set at liberty, the ring will be lost, or a false stone worth three francs will be given you, instead of a diamond worth fifty thousand, or perhaps fifty-five thousand francs, from which you must allow that one runs considerable risk in purchasing. Carderousse and his wife looked eagerly at each other. No, said Carderousse, we are not rich enough to lose five thousand francs. As you please, my dear sir, said the jeweller. I had, however, as you see, brought you the money in bright coin. And he drew from his pocket a handful of gold, and held it sparkling before the dazzled eyes of the innkeeper, and in the other hand he held a packet of banknotes. There was evidently a severe struggle in the mind of Carderousse, it was plain that the small chagrin case, which he turned over and over in his hand, did not seem to him commensurate in value 
to the enormous sum which fascinated his gaze. He turned towards his wife. What do you think of this? he asked in a low voice. Let him have it. Let him have it. Let him have it. Let him have it, she said. If he returns to Beaucaire without the diamond, he will inform against us. And as he says, who knows if we shall ever again see the Abbe Busoni? In all probability, we shall never see him. Well then, so I will, said Carderousse. So you may have the diamond for 45,000 francs. But my wife wants a gold chain, and I want a pair of silver buckles. The jeweller drew from his pocket a long flat box which contained several samples of the articles demanded. Here, he said, I am very straightforward in my dealings. Take your choice. The woman selected a gold chain worth about five louis, and the husband a pair of buckles worth perhaps fifteen francs. I hope you will not complain now, said the jeweller. The abbey told me it was worth fifty thousand francs, muttered Carderousse. Come, come, give it to me. What a strange fellow you are, said the jeweller, taking the diamond from his hand. I give you forty-five thousand francs. That is two thousand five hundred livres of income. A fortune such as I wish I had myself, and you are not satisfied. And the five and forty thousand francs, inquired Carderousse in a hoarse voice. Where are they? Come, let us see them. Here they are, replied the jeweller, and he counted out upon the table fifteen thousand francs in gold and thirty thousand francs in banknotes. Wait while I light the lamp, said La Carconte. It is growing dark and there may be some mistake. In fact, night had come on during this conversation, and with the night the storm which had been threatening for the last half hour. The thunder growled in the distance, but it was apparently not heard by the jeweller, Carderousse or La Carconte, absorbed as they were all three with the demon of gain. I myself felt a strange kind of fascination at the sight of all this gold and all these banknotes. It seemed to me that I was in a dream, and, as it always happens in a dream, I felt myself riveted to the spot. Carderousse counted and again counted the gold and the notes, then handed them to his wife, who counted and counted them again in her turn. During this time the jeweller made the diamond play and sparkle in the lamplight, and the gem threw out jets of light, which made him unmindful of those which, precursors of the storm, began to play in at the windows. Well, inquired the jeweller, is the cash all right? Yes, said Carderousse, give me the pocket-book, La Carconte, and find a bag somewhere. La Carconte went to a cupboard and returned with an old leathern pocket-book and a bag. From the former she took some greasy letters and put in their place the banknotes, and from the bag took two or three crowns of six livres each, which in all probability formed the entire fortune of the miserable couple. There, said Carderousse, and now, although you have wronged us of perhaps ten thousand francs, will you have your supper with us? I invite you with good will. Thank you, replied the jeweller. It must be getting late, and I must return to Beaucaire. My wife will be getting uneasy. He drew out his watch and exclaimed, More blue! Nearly nine o'clock! Why, I shall not get back to Beaucaire before midnight. Good night, my friends. If the Abbey Bersoni should by any accident return, think of me. In another week you will have left Beaucaire, remarked Carderousse, for the fair ends in a few days. True, but that makes no difference. Write to me at Paris, to Monsieur Joannis, in the Palais Royal, Arcade Pierre, number 45. I will make the journey on purpose to see him, if it is worth while. At this moment there was a tremendous clap of thunder, accompanied by a flash of lightning so vivid that it quite eclipsed the light of the lamp. See here, exclaimed Carderousse, you cannot think of going out in such weather as this. Oh, I'm not afraid of thunder, said the jeweller. And then there are robbers, said La Carconte. The road is never very safe during fair time. Oh, as to the robbers, said Joannes, here is something for them. And he drew from his pocket a pair of small pistols, loaded to the muzzle. Here, said he, 
are dogs who bark and bite at the same time. They are for the two first who shall have a longing for your diamond, friend Caderousse. Caderousse and his wife again interchanged a meaning look. It seemed as though they were both inspired at the same time with some horrible thought. Well, then, a good journey to you, said Caderousse. Thanks, replied the jeweller. He then took his cane, which he had placed against an old cupboard, and went out. At the moment when he opened the door, such a gust of wind came in that the lamp was nearly extinguished. Oh, said he, this is very nice weather, and two leagues to go in such a storm. Remain, said Caderousse, you can sleep here. Yes, do stay, added La Conte in a tremulous voice. We will take every care of you. No, I must sleep at Beaucaire. So once more, good night. Caderousse followed him slowly to the threshold. I can see neither heaven nor earth, said the jeweller, who was outside the door. Do I turn to the right or to the left hand? To the right, said Caderousse. You cannot go wrong. The road is bordered by trees on both sides. Good, all right, said a voice, almost lost in the distance. Close the door, said La Carconte. I do not like open doors when it thunders, particularly when there is money in the house, eh? answered Caderousse, double locking the door. He came into the room, went to the cupboard, and took out the bag and pocket-book, and both began for the third time to count their gold and banknotes. I never saw such an expression of cupidity as the flickering lamp revealed in these two countenances. The woman especially was hideous. Her usual feverish tremulousness was intensified. Her countenance had become livid, and her eyes resembled burning coals. Why, she inquired in a hoarse voice, did you invite him to sleep here to-night? Why, said Caderousse, with a shudder, why, that he might not have the trouble of returning to Beaucaire. Ah, responded the woman, with an expression impossible to describe, I thought it was for something else. Woman, woman, why do you have such ideas, cried Caderousse, or if you have them, why don't you keep them to yourself? Well, said La Carconte, after a moment's pause, you are not a man. What do you mean, added Caderousse? If you had been a man, you would not have let him go from here. Woman, or else he should not have reached Beaucaire. Woman, the road takes a turn. He is obliged to follow it, while alongside the canal there is a shorter road. Woman, you offend the good God. There, listen, and at this moment there was a tremendous peal of thunder while the livid lightning illumined the room, and the thunder rolling away in the distance seemed to withdraw unwillingly from the cursed abode. Mercy, said Caderousse, crossing himself. At the same moment, and in the midst of the terrifying silence which usually follows a clap of thunder, they heard a knocking at the door. Caderousse and his wife started and looked aghast at each other. Who's there? cried Caderousse rising and drawing up in a heap the gold and notes scattered over the table, and which he covered with his two hands. It is I, shouted a voice. And who are you? Eh, pardieu, Joannes, the jeweller. Well, and you said I offended the good God, said La Carconte, with a horrid smile. Why, the good God sends him back again. Caderousse sank pale and breathless into his chair. La Carconte, on the contrary, rose, and going with a firm step towards the door, opened it, saying as she did so, "'Come in, dear Monsieur Joannes.' "'Ma foi,' said the jeweller, drenched with rain, "'I am not destined to return to Beaucaire to-night. "'The shortest follies are best, my dear Caderousse. "'You offered me hospitality, and I accept it, "'and have returned to sleep beneath your friendly roof.' Caderousse stammered out something while he wiped away the sweat that started to his brow. La Carconte doubled locked the door behind the jeweller. End of chapter 44 Recording by Peter Keeble, Nottingham, United Kingdom Chapter 45 of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Keeble. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 45. The Reign of Blood. As the jeweller returned to the apartment, he cast around him a scrutinizing glance. But there was nothing to excite suspicion, if it did not exist, or to confirm it if it were already awakened. Caderousse's hand still grasped the gold and banknotes, and La Carconte called up her sweetest smiles while welcoming the reappearance of their guest. "'Well, well,' said the jeweller, "'you seem, my good friends, to have had some fears respecting the accuracy of your money by counting it over so carefully directly I was gone.' "'Oh, no!' answered Caderousse. That was not my reason, I can assure you, but the circumstances by which we have become possessed of this wealth are so unexpected as to make us scarcely credit our good fortune, and it is only by placing the actual proof of our riches before our eyes that we can persuade ourselves that the whole affair is not a dream. The jeweller smiled. Have you any other guests in your house? inquired he. Nobody but ourselves, replied Caderousse. The fact is, we do not lodge travellers. Indeed, our tavern is so near the town that nobody would think of stopping here. Then I am afraid I shall very much inconvenience you. Inconvenience us? Not at all, my dear sir, said La Carconte in her most gracious manner. Not at all, I assure you. But where will you manage to stow me? In the chamber overhead. Surely that is where your cells sleep. Never mind that. We have a second bed in the adjoining room. Caderousse stared at his wife with much astonishment. The jeweller, meanwhile, was humming a song as he stood warming his back at the fire La Carconte had kindled to dry the wet garments of her guest, and this done she next occupied herself in arranging his supper by spreading a napkin at the end of the table and placing it on the slender remains of their dinner, to which she added three or four fresh-laid eggs. Caderousse had once more parted with his treasure. The banknotes were replaced in the pocket-book, and the gold put back into the bag, and the whole carefully locked in the cupboard. He then began pacing the room with a pensive and gloomy air, glancing from time to time at the jeweller, who stood reeking with the steam from his wet clothes, and merely changing his place on the warm hearth to enable the whole of his garments to be dried. "'There,' said La Carconte, as she placed a bottle of wine on the table, Supper is ready whenever you are. And you, asked Johannes. I don't want any supper, said Caderousse. We dine so very late, hastily interposed La Carconte. Then it seems I am to eat alone, remarked the jeweller. Oh, we shall have the pleasure of waiting upon you, answered La Carconte, with an eager attention she was not accustomed to manifest, even to guests who paid for what they took. From time to time Caderousse darted on his wife keen, searching glances, but rapid as the lightning flash. The storm still continued. "'There, there,' said La Carconte, "'do you hear that? Upon my word, you did well to come back.' "'Nevertheless,' replied the jeweller, "'if by the time I have finished my supper the tempest has at all abated, I shall make another start.' "'It's the mistral,' said Caderousse and it will be sure to last till tomorrow morning. He sighed heavily. Well, said the jeweller, as he placed himself at table, all I can say is so much the worse for those who are abroad. Yes, chimed in La Carconte, they will have a wretched night of it. The jeweller began eating his supper, and the woman, who was ordinarily so querulous and indifferent to all who approached her, was suddenly transformed into the most smiling and attentive hostess. Had the unhappy man on whom she lavished her assiduities been previously acquainted with her, so sudden an alteration might well have excited suspicion in his mind, or at least have greatly astonished him. Caderousse, meanwhile, continued to pace the room in gloomy silence, sedulously avoiding the sight of his guest. But as soon as the stranger had completed his repast, the agitated innkeeper went eagerly to the door and opened it. I believe the storm is over, said he. But as if to contradict his statement, at that instant a violent clap of thunder seemed to shake the house to its very foundation, while a sudden gust of wind mingled with rain extinguished the lamp he held in his hand. Trembling and awestruck, Caderousse hastily shut the door 
and returned to his guest, while La Carconte lighted a candle by the smouldering ashes that glimmered on the hearth. "'You must be tired,' said she to the jeweller. "'I have spread a pair of white sheets on your bed. Go up and you are ready and sleep well.' Johannes stayed for a while to see whether the storm seemed to abate in its fury, but a brief space of time sufficed to assure him that instead of diminishing the violence of the rain and thunder, momentarily increased. Resigning himself, therefore, to what seemed inevitable, he bade his host good night and mounted the stairs. He passed over my head, and I heard the flooring creak beneath his footsteps. The quick, eager glance of La Carconte followed him as he ascended, while Carderousse, on the contrary, turned his back and seemed most anxiously to avoid even glancing at him. All these circumstances did not strike me as painfully at the time as they have since done. In fact, all that had happened, with the exception of the story of the diamond, which certainly did wear an air of improbability, appeared natural enough a call for neither apprehension nor mistrust, but worn out as I was with fatigue and fully purposing to proceed onwards directly the tempest abated, I determined to obtain a few hours' sleep. Overhead I could accurately distinguish every movement of the jeweller, who, after making the best arrangements in his power for passing a comfortable night, threw himself on his bed, and I could hear it creak and groan beneath his weight. Insensibly my eyelids grew heavy, deep sleep stole over me, and having no suspicion of anything wrong, I sought not to shake it off. I looked into the kitchen once more and saw Carderousse sitting by the side of a long table, upon one of the low wooden stools in which country places frequently use instead of chairs. His back was turned towards me so that I could not see the expression of his countenance. Neither should I have been able to do so had he been placed differently, as his head was buried between his two hands. La Carconte continued to gaze on him for some time, then shrugging her shoulders she took her seat immediately opposite him. At this moment the expiring embers threw up a fresh flame from the kindling of a piece of wood that lay near, and a bright light flashed over the room. La Carconte kept her eyes fixed on her husband, but as he made no sign of changing his position, she extended her hard, bony hand and touched him on the forehead. Carderousse shuddered. The woman's lips seemed to move as though she were talking, but because she merely spoke in an undertone, all my senses were dulled by sleep. I did not catch a word she uttered. Confused sights and sounds seemed to float before me, and gradually I fell into a deep, heavy slumber. How long I had been in this unconscious state I know not, when I was suddenly aroused by the report of a pistol, followed by a fearful cry. Weak and tottering footsteps resounded across the chamber above me, and the next instant a dull heavy weight seemed to fall powerless on the staircase. I had not yet fully recovered consciousness when again I heard groans, mingled with half-stifled cries, as if from persons engaged in a deadly struggle. A cry more prolonged than the others, and ending in a series of groans, effectually roused me from my drowsy lethargy. Hastily raising myself on one arm, I looked around, but all was dark, and it seemed to me as if the rain must have penetrated through the flooring of the room above, for some kind of moisture appeared to fall, drop by drop, upon my forehead, and when I passed my hand across my brow, I felt that it was wet and clammy. To the fearful noises that had awakened me had succeeded the most perfect silence, unbroken, save by the footsteps of a man walking about in the chamber above. The staircase creaked. He descended into the room below, approached the fire, and lit a candle. The man was Carderousse. He was pale, and his shirt was all bloody. Having obtained the light, he hurried upstairs again, and once more I heard his rapid and uneasy footsteps. A moment later he came down again, holding in his hand the small chagrin case, which he opened to assure himself it contained the diamond. Seemed to hesitate as to which pocket he should put it in. Then, as if dissatisfied with the security of either pocket, he deposited it in his red handkerchief, 
which he carefully rolled around his head. After this he took from his cupboard the banknotes and gold he had put there, thrust the one into the pocket of his trousers and the other into that of his waistcoat, hastily tied up a small bundle of linen, and rushing towards the door disappeared into the darkness of the night. Then all became clear and manifest to me, and I reproached myself with what had happened as though I myself had done the guilty deed. I fancied that I still heard faint moans, and imagining that the unfortunate jeweller might not be quite dead, I determined to go to his relief by way of atoning in some slight degree, not for the crime I had committed, but for that which I had not endeavoured to prevent. For this purpose I applied all the strength I possessed to force an entrance from the cramped spot in which I lay to the adjoining room. The poorly fastened boards which alone divided me from it yielded to my efforts, and I found myself in the house. Hastily snatching up the lighted candle, I hurried to the staircase. About midway a body was lying quite across the stairs. It was that of La Carconte. The pistol I had heard had doubtless been fired at her. The shot had frightfully lacerated her throat, leaving two gaping wounds from which, as well as the mouth, the blood was pouring in floods. She was stone dead. I strode past her and ascended to the sleeping chamber, which presented an appearance of the wildest disorder. The furniture had been knocked over in the deadly struggle that had taken place there, and the sheets, to which the unfortunate jeweller had doubtless clung, were dragged across the room. The murdered man lay on the floor, his head leaning against the wall, and about him was a pool of blood which poured forth from three large wounds in his breast. There was a fourth gash in which a long table knife was plunged up to the handle. I stumbled over some object. I stooped to examine. It was the second pistol which had not gone off, probably from the powder being wet. I approached the jeweller, who was not quite dead, and at the sound of my footsteps and the creaking of the floor, he opened his eyes, fixed them on me with an anxious and inquiring gaze, moved his lips as though trying to speak, then, overcome by the effort, fell back and expired. This appalling sight almost bereft me of my senses, and finding that I could no longer be of service to anyone in the house, my only desire was to fly. I rushed towards the staircase, clutching my hair and uttering a groan of horror. Upon reaching the room below, I found five or six custom-house officers and two or three gendarmes, all heavily armed. They threw themselves upon me. I made no resistance. I was no longer master of my senses. When I strove to speak, a few inarticulate sounds alone escaped my lips. As I noticed the significant manner in which the whole party pointed at my blood-stained garments, I involuntarily surveyed myself, and then I discovered that the thick warm drops that had so bedewed me as I lay beneath the staircase must have been the blood of Larcarconte. I pointed to the spot where I had concealed myself. What does he mean? asked a gendarme. One of the officers went to the place I directed. He means, replied the man upon his return, that he got in that way, and he showed the hole I had made when I broke through. Then I saw that they took me for the assassin. I recovered force and energy enough to free myself from the hands of those who held me, while I managed to stammer forth. I did not do it. Indeed, indeed, I did not. A couple of gendarmes held the muzzles of their carbines against my breast. Stir but a step, said they, and you are a dead man. Why should you threaten me with death, cried I, when I have already declared my innocence? Tush, tush, cried the men. Keep your innocent stories to tell to the judge at Nimes. Meanwhile, come along with us, and the best advice we can give you is to do so unresistingly. Alas, resistance was far from my thoughts. I was utterly overpowered by surprise and terror and without a word I suffered myself to be handcuffed and tied to a horse's tail, and thus they took me to Nimes. 
I had been tracked by a customs officer who had lost sight of me near the tavern. Feeling certain that I intended to pass the night there, he had returned to summon his comrades, who just arrived in time to hear the report of the pistol, and to take me in the midst of such circumstantial proofs of my guilt as rendered all hopes of proving my innocence utterly futile. One only chance was left me, that of beseeching the magistrate before whom I was taken to cause every inquiry to be made for the Abbey Bassoni, who had stopped at the inn of the Pont du Garde on that morning. If Carderousse had invented the story relative to the diamond, and there existed no such person as the Abbe Bossoni, indeed I was lost past redemption, or at least my life hung upon the feeble chance of Carderousse himself being apprehended and confessing the whole truth. Two months passed away in hopeless expectation on my part, while well, I must do the magistrate the justice to say that he used every means to obtain information of the person I declared could exculpate me if he would. Carderousse still evaded all pursuit, and I had resigned myself to what seemed my inevitable fate. My trial was to come on at the approaching assizes, when on the 8th of September, that is to say precisely three months and five days after the events which had perilled my life, the Abbe Busoni, whom I never ventured to believe I should see, presented himself at the prison doors, saying he understood one of the prisoners wished to speak to him. He added that having learned at Marseilles the particulars of my imprisonment, he hastened to comply with my desire. You may easily imagine with what eagerness I welcomed him, and how minutely I related the whole of what I had seen and heard. I felt some degree of nervousness as I entered upon the history of the diamond, but to my inexpressible astonishment he confirmed it in every particular, and to my equal surprise he seemed to place entire belief in all I said. And then it was that, won by his mild charity, seeing that he was acquainted with all the habits and customs of my own country, and considering also that pardon for the only crime of which I was really guilty, might come with a double power from lips so benevolent and kind, I besought him to receive my confession, under the seal of which I recounted the Orteil affair, in all its details, as well as every other transaction of my life. That which I had done by the impulse of my best feelings produced the same effect as though it had been the result of calculation. My voluntary confession of the assassination at Orteil proved to him that I had not committed that of which I stood accused. When he quitted me, he bade me be of good courage, and to rely upon his doing all in his power to convince my judges of my innocence. I had speedy proofs that the excellent Abbey was engaged in my behalf, for the rigours of my imprisonment were alleviated by many trifling though acceptable indulgences, and I was told that my trial was to be postponed to the assizes following those now being held. In the interim, it pleased Providence to cause the apprehension of Carderousse, who was discovered in some distant country and brought back to France, where he made a full confession, refusing to make the fact of his wife's having suggested and arranged the murder any excuse for his own guilt. The wretched man was sentenced to the galleys for life, and I was immediately set at liberty. And then it was, I presume, said Monte Cristo, that you came to me as the bearer of a letter from the Abbey Busoni. It was, Your Excellency, the benevolent Abbey took an evident interest in all that concerned me. Your mode of life as a smuggler, said he to me one day, will be the ruin of you. If you get out, don't take it up again. But how, inquired I, am I to maintain myself and my poor sister? A person whose confessor I am, replied he, and who entertains a high regard for me, applied to me a short time since to procure him a confidential servant. Would you like such a post? If so, I will give you a letter of introduction to him. Oh, father, I exclaimed, you are very good, but you must swear solemnly that I shall never have reason to repent my recommendation. I extended my hand and was about to pledge myself by any promise he would dictate, but he stopped me. 
it is unnecessary for you to bind yourself by any vow said he i know and admire the corsican nature too well to fear you here take this continued he after rapidly writing the few lines i brought to your excellency and upon receipt of which you deign to receive me into your service and proudly i ask whether your excellency has ever had cause to repent having done so no replied the count i take pleasure in saying that you have served me faithfully bertuccio but you might have shown more confidence in me are your excellency yes you how comes it that having both a sister and an adopted son you have never spoken to me of either alas i still have to recount the most distressing period of my life anxious as you may suppose i was to behold the comfort of my dear sister i lost no time in hastening to corsica but when i arrived at rogeliano i found a house of mourning the consequences of a scene so horrible that the neighbours remember and speak of it to this day acting by my advice my poor sister had refused to comply with the unreasonable demands of benedetto who was continually tormenting her for money as long as he believed there was a sou left in her possession one morning that he had demanded money threatening her with the severest consequences if she did not supply him with what he desired he disappeared and remained away all day leaving the kind-hearted assunta who loved him as if he were her own child to weep over his conduct and bewail his absence evening came and still with all the patient solicitude of a mother she watched for his return as the eleventh hour struck he entered with a swaggering air attended by two of the most dissolute and reckless of his boon companions she stretched out her arms to him but they seized hold of her and one of the three none other than the accursed benedetto exclaimed put her to torture and she'll soon tell us where her money is it unfortunately happened that our neighbour Vasilio was at Bastia, leaving no person in his house but his wife. No human creature beside could hear or see anything that took place within our dwelling. Two held poor Assunta, who, unable to conceive that any harm was intended to her, smiled in the face of those who were soon to become her executioners. The third proceeded to barricade the doors and windows and then returned, and the three united in stifling the cries of terror incited by the sight of these preparations, and then dragged Assunta, feet foremost, towards the brazier, expecting to wring from her an avowal of where her supposed treasure was secreted. In the struggle her clothes caught fire, and they were obliged to let go their hold in order to preserve themselves from sharing the same fate. Covered with flames, Assunta rushed wildly to the door, but it was fastened. She flew to the windows, but they were also secured. Then the neighbours heard frightful shrieks. It was Assunta calling for help. The cries died away in groans, and next morning, as soon as Vasilio's wife could muster up her courage to venture abroad, she caused the door of our dwelling to be opened by the public authorities, when Assunta, although dreadfully burned, was found still breathing every drawer and closet in the house had been forced open and the money stolen benedetto never again appeared at rogeliano neither have i since that day either seen or heard anything concerning him it was subsequently to these dreadful events that i waited on your excellency to whom it would have been folly to have mentioned benedetto since all trace of him seemed entirely lost or of my sister since she was dead and in what light did you view the occurrence inquired monte cristo as a punishment for the crime i had committed answered bertuccio oh those villefors are an accursed race truly they are murmured the count in a lugubrious tone and now resumed bertuccio your excellency may perhaps be able to comprehend that this place which i revisit for the first time this garden the actual scene of my crime must have given rise to reflections of no very agreeable nature and produced that gloom and depression of spirits which excited the notice of your excellency who was pleased to express a desire to know the cause 
At this instant a shudder passes over me as I reflect that possibly I am now standing on the very grave in which lies Monsieur de Villefort, by whose hand the ground was dug to receive the corpse of his child. "'Everything is possible,' said Monte Cristo, rising from the bench on which he had been sitting. "'Even,' he added, in an inaudible voice, "'even that the procureur be not dead.' "'The Abbe Busoni did right to send you to me.' He went on in his ordinary tone, and you have done well in relating to me the whole of your history, as it will prevent my forming any erroneous opinions concerning you in future. As for that Benedetto, who so grossly belied his name, have you never made any effort to trace out whither he has gone, or what has become of him? No, far from wishing to learn whither he has betaken himself, I should shun the possibility of meeting him as I would a wild beast. Thank God I have never heard his name mentioned by any person, and I hope and believe he is dead. Do not think so, Bertuccio, replied the Count, for the wicked are not so easily disposed of, for God seems to have them under his special watch-care to make of them instruments of his vengeance. So be it, responded Bertuccio. All I ask of heaven is that I may never see him again. And now, Your Excellency, he added, bowing his head, you know everything. You are my judge on earth, as the Almighty is in heaven. Have you for me no words of consolation? My good friend, I can only repeat the words addressed to you by the Abbe Busoni. Villefort merited punishment for what he had done to you, and perhaps to others. Benedetto, if still living, will become the instrument of divine retribution in some way or other, and then be duly punished in his turn. As far as you yourself are concerned, I see but one point in which you are really guilty. Ask yourself, wherefore, after rescuing the infant from its living grave, you did not restore it to its mother. There was the crime, Bertuccio. That was where you became really culpable. True Excellency, that was the crime, the real crime, for in that I acted like a coward. My first duty directly I had succeeded in recalling the babe to life, was to restore it to its mother. But in order to do so, I must have made close and careful inquiry, which would, in all probability, have led to my own apprehension, and I clung to life, partly on my sister's account, and partly from that feeling of pride, inborn in our hearts, of desiring to come off untouched and victorious in the execution of our vengeance. Perhaps, too, the natural and instinctive love of life made me wish to avoid endangering my own. And then again, I am not as brave and courageous as was my poor brother. Bertuccio hid his face in his hands as he uttered these words, while Monte Cristo fixed on him a look of inscrutable meaning. After a brief silence, rendered still more solemn by the time and place, the Count said in a tone of melancholy, wholly unlike his usual manner. In order to bring this conversation to a fitting termination, the last we shall ever hold upon this subject, I will repeat to you some words I have heard from the lips of the Abbe Busoni. For all evils there are two remedies, time and silence. And now leave me, Monsieur Bertuccio, to walk alone here in the garden. The very circumstances which inflict on you as a principle in the tragic scene enacted here, such painful emotions are to me, on the contrary, a source of something like contentment, and serve but to enhance the value of this dwelling in my estimation. The chief beauty of trees consists in the deep shadow of their umbrageous boughs, while fancy pictures a moving multitude of shapes and forms flitting and passing beneath that shade. Here I have a garden laid out in such a way as to afford the fullest scope for the imagination, and furnished with thickly grown trees, beneath whose leafy screen a visionary like myself may conjure up phantoms at will. This to me, who expected but to find a blank enclosure, surrounded by a straight wall, is, I assure you, a most agreeable surprise. I have no fear of ghosts and I have never heard it said that so much harm had been done by the dead during six thousand years as is wrought by the living in a single day. 
Retire within, Bertuccio, and tranquilize your mind. Should your confessor be less indulgent to you in your dying moments than you found in the Abbey Busoni, send for me, if I am still on earth, and I will soothe your ears with words that shall effectually calm and soothe your parting soul, ere it goes forth to traverse the ocean called eternity. Bertuccio bowed respectfully and turned away, sighing heavily. Monte Cristo, left alone, took three or four steps onwards and murmured, Here beneath this plane tree must have been where the infant's grave was dug. There is the little door opening into the garden. At this corner is the private staircase communicating with the sleeping apartment. There will be no necessity for me to make a note of these particulars, for there, before my eyes, beneath my feet, all around me, I have the plan sketched with all the living reality of truth. After making the tour of the garden a second time, the Count re-entered his carriage, while Bertuccio, who perceived the thoughtful expression of his master's features, took his seat beside the driver, without uttering a word. The carriage proceeded rapidly towards Paris. That same evening, upon reaching his abode in the Champs-Élysées, the Count of Monte Cristo went over the whole building, with the air of one long acquainted with each nook or corner. Nor, although preceding the party, did he once mistake one door for another, or commit the smallest error when choosing any particular corridor or staircase to conduct him to a place or suite of rooms he desired to visit. Ali was his principal attendant during this nocturnal survey. Having given various orders to Petuccio relative to the improvements and alterations he desired to make in the house, the Count, drawing out his watch, said to the attentive Nubian, It's half past eleven o'clock. Heidi will soon be here. Have the French attendants been summoned to await her coming? Ali extended his hands towards the apartments destined for the fair Greek, which were so effectively concealed by means of a tapestried entrance that it would have puzzled the most curious to have divined their existence. Ali, having pointed to the apartments, held up three fingers of his right hand, and then placing it beneath his head, shut his eyes and feigned to sleep. I understand, said Monte Cristo, well acquainted with Ali's pantomime. You mean to tell me that the three female attendants await their new mistress in her sleeping chamber? Ali, with considerable animation, made a sign in the affirmative. Madame will be tired tonight, continued Monte Cristo, and will no doubt wish to rest. Desire the French attendants not to weary her with questions, but merely to pay their respectful duty and retire. You will also see that the Greek servants hold no communication with those of this country. He bowed. Just at that moment voices were heard hailing the concierge. The gate opened, a carriage rolled down the avenue and stopped at the steps. The Count hastily descended, presented himself at the already open carriage door, and held out his hand to a young woman, completely enveloped in a green silk mantle, heavily embroidered with gold. She raised the hand extended towards her to her lips, and kissed it with a mixture of love and respect. Some few words passed between them in that sonorous language in which Homer makes his gods converse. The young woman spoke with an expression of deep tenderness, while the Count replied with an air of gentle gravity. Preceded by Ali, who carried a rose-coloured flambeau in his hand, the newcomer, who was no other than the lovely Greek, who had been Monte Cristo's companion in Italy, was conducted to her apartments while the Count retired to the pavilion reserved for himself. In another hour every light in the house was extinguished, and it might have been thought that all its inmates slept. End of chapter 45 Recording by Peter Keeble, Nottingham, United Kingdom.